even greater danger than Kalpi. What's going on guys? Welcome back to the Night Owl channel. Welcome back to the series where we're counting down the top Dynasty Warriors characters as of the latest game. Coming in at number 19, we have one of the most conniving, cunning, and borderline villainous characters within the game, Sima E. Sima E is an intellectual who is accredited as the ancestral founder of Western Jean. His wife is Shang Chun Wa, and he has two sons in Sima Shi and Sima Zhao. Once he agreed to serve the Sao family, he became one of Sao Pi's close friends and subsequently an influential figure in Wei, cunningly defending himself from his many detractors. Sao Sao suspected that Sima Yi would never be satisfied serving under another, an opinion which would ring true years later when the Sima family reigned supreme after his death. Romance of the Three Kingdoms depicts him as a conniving individual who was intimidated and infuriated by Zhuge Liang's keen mental discernment. Before we jump into how Sima Yi has changed in the series since his playable debut back in Dynasty Warriors 2, let's take a look at the popularity poll to see why Sima Yi ranks up all the way up here at number 19. In the first popularity poll, consisting of about 75,000 total votes, Sima Yi is going to come in at number 18 with 1,371 of those votes. And then in the second popularity poll, he's going to drop down to the 23rd position. And then in my personal ranking, he's going to drop down to the 38th position. So for me personally, Sima Yi is the lowest among the three lists because Sima Yi is not really a character that I particularly favor. I don't have anything really against the character but he's not a type of character that I'm particularly attracted to playing. He was never a character that I really, you know, liked that much. Can never really get into like the fan style and then his personality in the earlier games was definitely a dissuadement for me for the character. He definitely had his savage moments, but he was never a character that I really wanted to play through. The only reason I would play him is for, you know, weapon unlocks or, you know, unlocking certain characters or Musa Mojo. Or if I had to use him for a certain goal, that's when I would play through him. And as we talk more about the character, how he's changed and everything about the character, I'll explain a little bit more why. But for me personally, he just wasn't a character that I particularly connect with. But before we jump into all that and how Sima E, the intelligent, decisive, and extraordinary talent that he was has changed within the series, let's talk a little bit more about Sima E for people who don't know. So like I said, Sima E was a Chinese military general, politician, and regent of the state of Sao Wei during the Three Kingdoms period of China. He formally began his political career in 208 under the Han Dynasty's Imperial Chancellor Cao Cao, quickly rising through his ranks. He succeeded in handling both domestic and military affairs, and he served as a capable advisor are repelling multiple invasions and incursions led by the Shu and Wu forces. He would then go on to increase his merit as a general by crushing rebellions and conquering certain commanders within the region, which garnered him great prestige over the decades, and he is perhaps best known for defending Wei from a series of invasions led by Wei's rival state Shu. Later on within his career, as the Cao family's power was dying out and the current leader of the Cao family, Cao Shuang, was blatantly taking advantage of his position, indulging in corruption, extravagance, and attempting to curtail Sima Yi's political influence. Sima Yi would then carefully plan and build up support to oust Cao Shuang from power in a coup d'etat and had him and his associates executed, resulting in the end of the Cao clan power and resulting in the Sima clan becoming the main staple in the Wei Kingdom at that time. A couple years later, he would face opposition to this move in the form of a rebellion, which he dealt with rapidly and swiftly. But later that year, he would end up dying and having to pass on the reign of 
of leadership to his eldest son, Sima Shi. He was originally introduced as a calm and gloomy strategist, but Sima Yi eventually became a man who was more arrogant and conniving. He's known for his maniacal laughter. <laughs> An insulting friend and foe alike as fool or imbecile. He doesn't truly believe in Sasa, but is always eager to exploit every opportunity given to him. And prideful of his intellect and believing that he has an unsurpassed wit, he actually regards Zhuge Liang as a worthy opponent. Later on in the game, Sima Yi does show more genuine loyalty towards both Sao Sao and Sao Pi, deeming that the two were worthy of having him serve them. And as the series progresses, Sima Yi starts to lose most of his original sinister aspects while his reasons for wanting to rule and welfare the land are more shined upon. Sima Yi solely believes in both true wit and talent being the qualities needed as opposed to a chosen birthright, and this in turn makes Sima Yi feel that only a person such as himself can be trusted with the affairs of ruling the land. Sima Yi is a very interesting character because he started out as a almost genuine villain, but then later on in the games he becomes, I would say, a little more softer as he starts to accept the fact that the people he was serving, whether that be Sao Sao, Sao Pi, or even Sao Rui, he deemed them worthy rulers of leading and guiding the land to a place of peace, and until Sao Shuang ends up taking over over and again ends up abusing his power, Sima Yi then realizes that he needs to take the kingdom into his own hands before everything that he's worked so hard for comes to a crash. And personally for me, I like Sima Yi's personality in the later games versus some of the earlier ones. We already have a main like villain in the game that's with Dong Zhuo. Like, I don't think there's really any fans of Dong Zhuo out there and that's because he is a genuine villainous character. He's that character that you love to hate. And Sima Yi in the earlier games had that same aura and vibe, but I I don't think it was necessarily needed. I like the savage moments that he had within the game and that feeling of like almost arrogance and unsurpassability that he had among other people. Like when the young strategist Lu Xun approaches him, he just disregards him as someone that's, you know, talentless and not even worthy to really approach him. You have no right to confront me. I'm out of your league! Which I don't mind seeing at all. I think that really adds to Sima Yi's personality because you're going to have people within the kingdom who are like that. But I like in the later games that he still has that personality of unsurpassability and believing that he is the greatest strategist among the current people. However, it's grounded in a little bit of humility and understanding that, well, one, he's not going to be able to rule forever. So being able to pass down these talents and qualities to his sons is very important to him. Having that relationship with his two sons is extremely important because he wants them to be able to rule successfully after he has passed away or is no longer able to help them. We'll dive deeper into his relationship towards the latter part of the video, but I just wanted to point that out because Sima Yi is a character that I grew to like as the series went on, but in the beginning he wasn't a character that I particularly favored. And even though in the earlier games I really didn't like his personality per se, I did like to see how he would go about taking over the kingdom when he did his personal coup d'etat to like Sao Sao. Those are always really fun to watch and how those would unfold. Because it's a very unique event that doesn't happen in any of the other games. So seeing that play through in his Dynasty Warriors 6 story mode was actually pretty fun to play through. But I think Dynasty Warriors 6 is a good mix of that both personalities because he definitely has the sinister, conniving, cunning, villainous tone. However, at the end of his story, you can see that understanding and reasoning of what a ruler should be and what a ruler should entail. And he wasn't afraid to show his abrasiveness towards faulty logic, even if it was someone like his own son. But with that being said, let's go ahead and just jump straight into how Sima Yi has changed within the games. I can talk a lot about Sima Yi. He has a lot of content and he goes through a lot of changes throughout the game personality wise and his story. I'm not going to say his story was boring. I genuinely liked Sima Yi's story. I always like to see what he does next, and it's very intriguing to see what plan he comes up with in order to topple his enemies. But we're going to jump straight into how he's changed within the series, so we're going to start off with Sima Yi's appearance. So Sima Yi's appearance in the game, for me personally, is relatively okay. He maintains a similar look throughout all the games, and he has a strategist kind of look to him. That's probably why I don't like him that much in terms of appearance, because I'm not really into the strategist look. In terms of Sima Yi, I think it fits him really, really well. In all the games, I think the games relatively follow the same template for how Sima Yi looks. And I can't really complain about the way he looks. Even the jump from Dynasty Warriors 5 to Dynasty Warriors 6, I still thought he looked pretty good in Dynasty Warriors 6. He still had that villainous aura. He still looked like, you know, you don't know what he's thinking. What is he going to do next? And it's really concealed well with how 
see my E looks. For me personally, the best looks for me is going to be Dynasty Warriors 6, Dynasty Warriors 9, and probably Dynasty Warriors 3. Those are probably going to be my three favorites, but I can't complain too much about the way he looks. Now moving on to his weapon style, the Sima E goes through a few changes within the Dynasty Warriors series. In the first game he's playable, he gets a sword, which is fine. It's just your basic average sword. And then in Dynasty Warriors 3, he gets the fan. So he has the fan in the majority of the games and it fits him as a character. He is a strategist. It's almost a direct counter to like Juge Leong's fan. He's got his black fan and Juge Leong has, you know, a white fan. And because of that rivalry being so intense, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the relationship section, it fits Simai really, really well. In Dynasty Warriors 6 and 8, he gets two different weapons. In Dynasty Warriors 6, he gets the wired gloves. And in Dynasty Warriors 8, he gets the horsehair whip. So both of these weapons were okay. I really didn't like the horsehair whip though. I, I didn't really have that much fun with it. The Musao attacks were really good for the whip. Really, really strong. Really, really good. Big AoE. Uh, the earlier games, the Musao attack was okay. Uh, he shot out the giant beams that were pretty cool. Very easy to clear out enemies. You know, very good AoE Musao attacks for Sima E. Can't complain too much about it. Dynasty Warriors 6 was okay. I believe his Musao attack actually resembled closely to his, like, combo. His full combo. But it was an okay Musao style. Can't complain too much about it. Um, Dynasty Warriors 7 and 8, I think, believe he had similar ones. And it actually resembled the grapple attacks in Dynasty Warriors 6, which was, it was alright. Wasn't too bad. I like the aerial Musaos. Those were pretty cool. Kind of like ice needles came out of them or something. And that was pretty fun to use. But in Dynasty Warriors nine he goes back to the beams for his musao attack but instead of like one like directional beam it's like a bunch of them that come out of it it was pretty cool but i really like this move set with the fan so even in the earlier games and then in the later ones i would say dynasty wars 9 was a little bit better than dynasty wars 7 dynasty wars 7 was just fine too but i did not mind the move set that he had with the fan style it was pretty fun a lot of aoe damage dynasty wars 7 and 8 i liked his ex attack it was very very powerful and then i like that they brought some of the moves he had in the earlier game back in Dynasty Wars 9. It's just cool to see that, you know, if someone's a big Sima E fan, they're gonna like that nostalgia that Sima E is brought back with his Dynasty Wars 9 style. I never really was into the fan style. The horsehair whip was okay. The wire gloves again were okay. And for me, the weapon style was just an average style. It wasn't anything that I would run to play again. All right, I'm moving on to his voice acting. And I think this is the strongest component of the character. Sima E has some really good voice actors within the game. I really liked his voice acting from Dynasty Warriors 6 through 8. He had the exact same person. And I think he did a really good job with his voice acting. The great Juge Leong. What other tricks do you have in store? Definitely added to that intimidating, villainous tone. And it added to that mystery of what is he going to do next? What is he thinking about? Of course, the maniacal laughter. <laughs> I think the guy from Dynasty Warriors 6 through 8 did it the best. Dynasty Warriors 6, for me, hands down, is the best maniacal laughter that Sima Yi has done. And then in Dynasty Warriors 3 and 4, I believe he had two different ones. Dynasty Warriors 3 was probably a little bit better. So they've come. Destroy them all! Than the one he had in Dynasty Warriors 4. You know nothing of strategy. Wait and see. But they were both fine. No, I couldn't complain about it. But then moving on to Dynasty Warriors 5, he gets a different voice. Soon, Shu Ge Leong will perish. And Shu will fall. And I'm going to say that I liked it. But I think I liked it more because of the lines that Sima E was saying versus the voice itself. I think the voice really played into the conniving individual that Sima E was being tailored towards like it was very accentuated that he was a villainous character the combination with the voice acting and the lines made the voice acting not that bad at least to me but it was very clear it was very prominent that the voice was leaning more towards you know Sima E is a villain in this game and you can tell just by the way he sounds like it wasn't like a hidden thing like in Dice War 6 through 8 it was more of a hidden voice you know it was more of like it's there but it's not so obvious and then Dynasty Warriors 9, it takes an interesting turn. Lord Salsa, left behind an able successor in Lord P. And I can't complain too much about it. I would say it's probably on the same level as like the Dynasty Warriors 4 actor. It's okay. Like it's not as good as it previously was, but it still fits him. But I can't complain too much about the voice acting. I think his voice acting was relatively strong for most of the games. And with that being said, let's go ahead and move on to the last few segments, which is going to be the significant battles, his relationships, and his death. 
So Sima E within the game has a few significant battles. I believe within history, he was less of like an actual warrior and more of a strategist. That's why, you know, that's probably why they went with the way he looked. But I don't think he was on the field of battle that much. So we're going to start off with the Battle of Fawn Castle. Uh, the Battle of Fawn Castle is very important for Sima E, especially within the games, because he's always the commander or one of the commanders in that game. So it's usually Sao Ren or Sima E. Sima E is the one who recommends to Sao Sao that, hey, we should get Wu to attack uh, Jing province while Guan Yu's up here in Fawn Castle to cut him off, surround him, and we can end up killing him. And because of that suggestion, Guan Yu ends up passing away. And the era of the Three Kingdoms shifts dramatically after that battle. Next up, the Battle of New Hefei Castle. I don't think this was a historical battle for him, but because this battle was so prevalent in his early games, I'm going to include it because his rivalry with Lu Xun and then of course just the Wu forces in general during this battle. This is the last battle for usually the Wei Kingdom, you know, dominating China and or, you know, killing the Wu Kingdom. It's usually the last battle with Wu. And it's a very important battle because at least within the earlier games, you know, Sima Yi is having a lot of cutscenes and interactions with, you know, either it's Lu Xun or Sun Jian or Sun Quan's plan to, you know, bring reinforcements to the battle, whatever it is, Sima Yi is there to counteract every strategy they come up with to, again, show that unsurpassability in strategy. And because he was so prevalent within the earlier games within that battle, I think that also, personally for me, I think that's a significant battle for Sima Yi, just in the earlier games. In the later games, he becomes less a part of it. He's indirectly a part of it, though, because of the relationship he has with Man Chong. So I guess we'll just talk about that real quick. So he had a minor relationship with Man Chong. He was part of his ending in Dynasty Wars 9. And Man Chong was responsible for building the new Hefei castle where this battle is taking place. You know, Man Chong is showing him all the new traps and gimmicks and everything like that. So minor relationship there, minor battle there, but it was important in the earlier games for Sima E. Next up, probably his most significant battle within the games, and that is the Battle of Wu Zhang Plain. So this is the battle between Sima E and Zhu Ge Liang. Some games, you know, Liu Bei's there, Cao Cao's there, of course, and everything like that. But this is the battle where, you know, Zhu Ge Liang and Sima E go head to head in their strategies to see who comes out on top. It's a very important battle for Sima E because up to this point, he deemed Zhuge Liang a worthy opponent. They've already had several battles before, but this was like the climax of these two characters coming together and battling it out one last time. During this battle, Zhuge Liang ends up passing away, but the victory at Wu Zhang for Sima Yi is an extremely important battle because it pretty much signifies to Sima Yi the end of Shu because after Zhuge Liang passes, he deems there is nobody else that can match up to him, no matter who they are. That's why when Lu Xun approaches him, he kind of brushes him off. When Zheng Wei approaches him, he's like, you're not worthy to be Zhuge Liang's protege. So that's the battle where Sima Yi kind of loses his rival and not, I wouldn't say his motivation, but like after that point, he realizes there's nobody else worthy, really talent-wise, that can compete with Sima Yi. Very important battle for him. It's one of the staples within the game. And I would say it's his most significant battle within the series. Now, moving on to his last two battles, we're going to talk about the coup d'etat and Wang Ling's Rebellion. We'll talk about Wang Ling's Rebellion real quick because it's kind of shorter. Uh, it wasn't much of a battle. Of course, the games make it into one, but he ends up, Sima ends up like, I think, predicting it so fast where he preemptively strikes out against Wang Ling and gets him to surrender immediately. So it was not really much of a battle. And the other important thing I want to note about it is his relationship with Gu Hawaii here because... Uh, after, you know, the surrender and he captures Wang Ling and he ends up executing Wang Ling and then like any associates and like their family members and stuff. Gu Hawaii, who was an officer under Sima Yi, was married to the younger sister of Wang Ling. So Gu Hawaii, you know, his wife was taken away from him. He did nothing. But like we talked about in his episode, his sons came up to him and kowtowed until their head started to bleed, which pushed Gu Hawaii to ask, Sima Yi to pardon his wife. And I just want to mention that really quick because there is a minor relationship there because, you know, Gu Hawaii is, you know, his ending. He's got Sima Yi there. He's part of it. And within the games, and I believe within history, I don't know if he was as nice about it, but uh, Sima Yi was understanding of Gu Hawaii and respecting of the achievements and accolades that he has acquired up to that point in time. He was able to pardon Gu Hawaii's wife and really cement that relationship. And then finally, moving on to the last significant battle, the coup d'etat, extremely important battle because this is the moment where the Sao family, the Shaho clan, the original retainers of Wei end up losing pretty much all of their power within the Wei kingdom and the Sima clan rises to the top. Sima Yi deemed the current leader, Sao Shuang, as an incompetent ruler who was, you know, taking advantage of his current position, very greedy, very irresponsible with the power that he recently acquired. And Sima Yi within the games determined that if he 
allow this to continue, it would eventually lead to the downfall of everything that he created in the first place. And he does whatever he can to help protect the foundations that he helped build since the beginning with Cao Cao. Very important battle because it establishes, again, the Sieben clan's rise to power, and it also establishes the beginning of pretty much the Jin dynasty. Now, moving on to his relationships, we already talked about a couple of them, but we're going to go over all the ones that he has within the games. So, of course, he's going to have a relationship with his family, Sima Shi, Sima Zhao, and Shang Chun Wa. Very close because they're all family. He wants the best for his family. He's very proud of his family. And he wants his family to, you know, especially his sons, to be able and be ready in a position that when he goes, they can take over successfully. He also has a very close relationship with Cao Cao and Cao Pi. These are the two people that he deemed worthy to serve under. And then the last major relationship he's going to have is with Zhang He. And then a few more minor relationships. We already mentioned Guo Huai and we already mentioned Man Chong. And then outside of the kingdom, he has minor relationships with Zhu Liang, Zheng Wei, and Lu Xun. These three are not friendly relationships. They are more of a belittling kind of relationship, except for maybe Zhu Liang. I mean, he still belittles Zhu Liang, but at least, you know, he respects him on terms of a rival. But let's start off with uh, Sima Shi, Sima Zhao, and Shang Chun Wa. So Sima Shi and Sima Zhao, again, are his sons. And again, he wants the best for them so that they are able to take over when Sima Yi moves on or passes away. So from the beginning of the Jin story, you have, you know, Sima Yi trying to teach them what to do on the battlefield, how to deal with things. And he eventually, at least within the games, he lets Sima Shi succeed him early. So that way, when Sima Shi is going through his story and going through his battles and rebellions and stuff, Sima Yi can watch his progress and give him real-time advice on what he's doing. So that way he understands, you know, the rights and wrongs of being a ruler. But he's very proud of both of his sons and he just wants the best for them. And he believes in them wholeheartedly that they have the intellect, the talent, and the ability to become the best leaders possible. And moving on to his relationship with his wife, Shang Chun Hua. They have a very interesting dynamic with each other. So again, this villainous, you know, cunning, conniving... Among the top tier strategists within the game, it's able to be put in check by his wife. So the relationship that he has with his wife, he at some points would say he would fear her. He definitely um, respects her opinion on whatever it is that she's doing. If she's coming into battle and asking him, should I go with you? This dude can't barely speak a sentence when she's talking to him. And it's just really funny to see that that Sima E, who is this, again, all those things that I've mentioned and, and more, able to be easily swayed by his wife when she suggests something or when she, within the games, forces him to retire early so that way their sons can grow up and be competent leaders. So it's just very interesting dynamic to see. I'm sure they, you know, within the games love each other very much and you know, I'm sure he respects her opinions because she's not just doing things out of her personal requests or like her personal gains. It's for the good of the whole kingdom. And I think he understands that. And that's why he's able to, even though maybe not, he doesn't want to do something, he still does it anyway because she has good intentions behind it. Now, moving on to his relationship with Cao Cao and Cao Pi. In the earlier games, I would say his relationship with these two was more of a manipulative and like, you know, villainous one. You can see him questioning Cao Cao's motives or like what he's doing and why would you want to do that idiotic and then with Sao P there's definitely a little bit more hatred especially in Dynasty Wars 5 when Sao P becomes a playable character and then you have Sima E with, with this villainous voice those two bump heads quite a bit and you can see the tension that these two have in a couple instances but uh, as the games move on you can see that Sao Sao and Sao P Sima E ends up cherishing them he ends up becoming a little bit I would say a little bit more closer to Sao P than Sao Sao. Sao Sao definitely cherishes and treasures Sima E as a strategist and definitely respects his talent. I mean, that's why Sao Sao, you know, recruited him in the first place. But after Sao Sao passes away, Sao Pi then becomes the ruler and Sima Yi deemed him a worthy ruler. He actually liked Sao Pi's plan of ruling the land a little bit more than Sao Sao. So those two had a very close relationship. He was his advisor. You know, Sima Yi was actually very interested to hear what Sao Pi had to say in different situations and everything. It was just interesting to see that relationship kind of progress from the hatred, the hostility, the manipulation to more of a respect and understanding and very cohesive, inherent relationship that they had later on within the series. Now, moving on to his last significant relationship with Zhang He, I think his relationship with Zhang He is more significant than, you know, some of the other generals within the Wei Kingdom because, you know, Zhang He has been there for a long time and these two have cutscenes from, you know, the earlier games all the way up until the latest ones. 
And I think Sima E really respects Zhang Hei's versatility, adaptability, and just the value that he brings as a general to the Wei Kingdom. Sima Yi and you know the leaders of Wei can really rely on Zhang Hei to do things for them and get it done successfully. And then of course in Dynasty Warriors 6, during the hypothetical route, you know, of Sima Yi overthrowing Cao Cao, Zhang Hei ends up joining Sima Yi's side. And regardless of the antics that Zhang Hei is known for, you know, Sima Yi doesn't particularly see that. He sees his talent, he sees what he's able to bring, his value, and that's enough for him to trust him as an officer, as a general underneath him. Now moving on to his more minor relationships, we already mentioned Guo Huai, and we already mentioned Man Chong. Let's talk about the relationships outside the kingdom. So let's start off with Zhuge Liang. Probably one of the most iconic rivalries within the game is the one between Zhuge Liang and Sima Yi. Sima Yi, again, being this arrogant, villainous, conniving, just thinks that he can't be beat. You know, this unsurpassability that Sima Yi has. The only person that he recognized as his equal was Zhuge Liang. In terms of strategy, in terms of an enemy, he was the only person that he deemed a worthy rival. It was almost at times where Sima Yi was like, he was like eager to see what Zhuge Liang would come up with next, just so that Sima Yi could plan and try to beat it. It was almost like a fun game for Sima Yi, and he really enjoyed going against Zhuge Liang and seeing what other tricks he had up in store. A very iconic rivalry, and that's why the lead up to the Battle of the Wuzhang Plains was so, I think it was so big, because it was the last time that these, that these two great strategists came together and put their best foot forward to see who would come out on top. You know, during that period that he was going against the Shu forces back to back to back when the northern campaigns were just, you know, never ending, he had the ability to really push himself and be like, okay, let me see what Zhuge Liang does next. Let me see if I can counteract that. And when he does counteract that, you know, he makes sure that it's known. He laughs, he feels good, he's like, I see that coming. And it was a rivalry that really pushed Sima Yi to become the best version of himself when he was presented with Zhuge Liang. It's definitely very important for him as a character because, again, a character that's so arrogant and only thinks of himself as the best, when he actually deems another character someone equal level to him, that's a pretty astounding thing to have. And then moving on to his other two minor relationships outside the kingdom, so Zheng Wei and Lu Xun. The relationship with these two is very similar. I've already mentioned it. He kind of just brushes them aside. You know, he's looking for that next challenge, a natural competitor. He wants to see who can come out on top, you know, if he can actually best somebody. He's a very strategy-minded character, and when he has the ability to test his strategies against other people's strategies, it like, I would say it almost excites him. But because Jiang Wei and Lu Xun, in his eyes, he doesn't see them as worthy competitors, it's almost boring. You know, it's almost like a yawn for him. And the relationship he has with those two is definitely more of a belittling one than one of respect. And then finally, we'll talk about Sima Yi's death. He dies of illness after a certain point, and that was pretty much it. He was pretty old when he dies, and I believe he got everything he could out of his lifetime. But that's pretty much all I have for Sima Yi here, guys. Guys, that's everything about the character. I, again, personally, he's just a character that I've never really connected with personally. I just don't really... You know, we just don't connect. I just have a little bit of a disconnect with Sima Yi. I can understand the like for him, but for me personally, he was a character that I never really connected with. You know, the weapon style was okay. I just don't really connect with the strategist look that much. I always like the warrior style look, but he's not a bad character. I think he fits well within the series, and he definitely has a pivotal story within the kingdom. I mean, he's the one that sets up his kingdom for unification. So it's a very important character, and I don't particularly mind him. He's just not a character that I particularly would jump to play within the series. But again, that's all I really have for Sima E. Let me know what you guys think about him down below. Do you guys like him? What do you guys think about him? Did I miss anything? He's got a lot of information. He's done a lot, but I covered the most important things, at least within the game, for Sima E. But that's all I have, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, definitely appreciate a like, comment, or subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching, everyone.